welcome to Liz as well. All right, I'm turning on the live captions. I think that I do have captions um, also embedded in the in the presentation. So apologies if there are double captions. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of buttons. I absolutely agree, but. Hello everyone, I wanted to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us. Um, today we're talking about digital equity. So I'm gonna go ahead and screen share at this point so y'all can see and hear my presentation. So here we go, I am going to do the present review. Ta-da, okay, hopefully it's showing up for you the way that it is showing up for me. Okay, <laughs> so hello and um, Thank you again so much for joining us. So my name is Sarah Thomas. Um, by day, I'm a regional technology coordinator and I work in a large school district in Maryland. Um, in by night, I guess I would say, um, then I work as a regional, uh, no, I'm sorry, I just said that. <laughs> so by day, um, I work as a regional um, regional tech coordinator and um, in the evening sometimes I adjunct at Loyola University. Okay, thank you about the blank screen. I, I definitely, uh, let me see if I can get it working a little better. There we go. I think that that's, I think that that's working a little better. So um, I also, I'm affiliate faculty at Loyola University and they are teaching the Masters of Ed Tech program. Um, in addition, this is, I'm rounding out my 15th year in education. So about to start the sweet, the sweet 16 in August. Super excited about that. And what a year we've all had, right? Um, I'm also the founder of a grassroots organization called EduMatch, which is all about, um, which is all about connecting educators around the world so that we can learn and grow together. Uh, so, and I'm also the co-author of um, the ISTE Closing the Gap series. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and get cracking. Oh, and by the way, before I continue, you might see at the bottom of my Twitter handle. If you are a Twitter person, I would love, love, love to connect with you. So I'm at Sarah the Teacher. It's spelled kind of funky there, but um, please connect if you are on Twitter. All right, and I'm seeing I'm seeing the comments come through. Thank you all so so much. Absolutely, and hello to Lisa. Hello to everybody who's joining right now. All right, so this presentation is all about digital equity. So just to make sure that we are all on the same page, then digital equity. This was a um, this was a very simple definition given to me by my friend Dr. Avril Smart, who works with uh, Future Ready. Um, and she said the digital equity pretty, pretty much means digital transformation for all. And I just want to emphasize that all piece, digital transformation for all students, each of our students that we have right now. Um, I'm seeing in the comments, Lisa, hello, welcome. Um, so yeah, so we definitely want to make sure that we have digital transformation for each of our students. And just, uh, um, kind of a, a full transparency moment. When I created this presentation, this was pre-COVID. Now, when we are like at the current time, we are seeing that with um, remote learning and remote teaching, then digital equity is taking on even more importance and there's even more nuances that are coming through. Um, for example, when we are, um, when we're seeing the support that we give to our students parents, right? Uh, native language support, um, support in terms of, of troubleshooting with technology. Of course, the access to devices and, and internet, which goes without even saying, um, but there's so many implications when it comes to digital equity. In this past school year, as we've seen before this past school year, I'm just really refreshed and happy that we are having more and more discussions about digital equity and what exactly that means. OK, and Craig, thank you so much for um, for dropping the links in the chat. Absolutely. All right. So digital equity is um, so when when I say the term digital equity, I'm, I'm just going to pause for a second and have you please put in chat. What does digital equity mean to you? OK, so just at any point, feel free to answer that question. What digital equity means to you? So some people when i use the phrase digital equity 
they think of access to devices, access to high speed Internet. Um, the phrase homework gap has become more and more prevalent. Um, so that that is one thing that people think about sometimes when we talk about digital equity. I see that Patrick saying leveling out the opportunities for learning virtually. Absolutely. OK, some people also think about access to funding, right? Um, like, for example, what resources do I have available if I want to supply X, Y, and Z to my students, right? So the access to funding is also um, is also a part of digital equity. I'm seeing that Jackie is saying resources, access to internet, best practice across all schools. Yep. Gail, access to devices, broadband, parents' ability to help students. Yep, yep. Lisa, bringing all students what they need to succeed in their futures. Yes, absolutely. So, so if we look at the first, uh, the first two pictures that I talked about, the, the access to devices and the access to, to the funding, then sometimes people make the mistake of stopping there. I can already see that in the room, then we're already going way beyond just the devices. Right. The devices are a part of it, but there's also more. For example, access to opportunities such as those for transformational learning. Also, access to high quality explanation or I'm sorry, education. Excuse my <laughs> excuse my slip of the tongue. I'm, I'm also reading the comments as they're coming up. Access to devices and knowing how to use them. Everyone knowing how to use them. Everyone knows how to use technology effectively. Absolutely. So. I went to a future ready workshop back in um, goodness. This was November 2019, so a little over a year ago, back when we were doing a lot of face to face <laughs> opportunities and we were asked to brainstorm what uh, learning would look like in five years. And so we were broken into small groups and this is what our small group came up with. Um, balanced values for stakeholders, anywhere, anytime learning, high expectations, competency and mastery, realistic personalized learning, cultural competence, empowering student agency, majority non-native speakers and self-driven global collaboration and learning, right? And, and one thing I should point out is that I'm in the United States. So I know that we have a global audience here, um, but this is this is kind of what my team um, at my table brainstormed that education will, would look like in five years. And we had no idea that in what a little over a year that the game would be totally changed and we would be achieving or working towards achieving some of these more quickly because now they are necessities as opposed to, um, you know, the pace that we've been seeing the trickle pace, so it were, that, that we had been seeing in the past, right? So now um, I can say that in my district and in some others, and I've been seeing a lot of change very, very quickly. Um, and, and some of these are starting to become a promising reality, um, but there's also a lot of work left to be done globally, um, all around the country, the United States, all around different countries as well. You know, there's uh, it's it's almost like that theme song, the facts of life. You take the good, you take the bad. So we're seeing some tremendous examples of growth from our school districts, from our schools, from our teachers, from our parents. Um, but we're also seeing that some of the inequities are becoming more and more in our face. Um, and so so that is kind of why this topic is so um, so important and so near and dear to me. Okay, um, let me see. I think that somebody might be unmuted. So if you wouldn't mind just uh, muting yourself, please, that would be great. Um, but I should also say, if you do have a question or a comment or you'd like to chime in, we're a nice cozy group here. So please feel free if you have something that you wanna share then um, to do so. Um, either in the chat, I'm seeing all the comments coming through or um, if you wanted to just kind of pop in and um, and share, then that's cool. We all learn from one another. You know, we're we're all educators and lifelong learners. So I would love to hear any thoughts that you all have as well. Okay. Now, seeing some comments. Speaking of comments, Craig is saying all digital content and lessons are not the same. There's lots to consider with distance learning or hybrid learning with that lens on digital equity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you for dropping that Facts of Life theme song. Okay, so 
a little further back in 2018, I went to a conference, Q Nevada, and there I saw uh, two of my friends, Adam Juarez and Kat Goyette, and they were, um, they shared Fortune 500's list of most valued skills from 1970 to today. So I'm just gonna let you go ahead and take a look at this list really quickly. Um, please type in the comments if anything kind of pops out to you. Like, what do you notice about this? So I'll just pause for a quick second and let you go ahead and type type in your comments what you see that kind of pulls your attention. Yes, absolutely. I see your comment, Craig, about um, Kat and Adam. They were not married yet at the time. I think that they did at the um, at the next Q event. Um, so absolutely. All right. So I'm seeing Gail is saying reading way down the list. OK, all right. For today, mm -hmm. there are a lot of similarities. Absolutely, James. Anita saying today we need more soft skills. Mm -hmm. Patsy is saying writing went out of the window into communication. Mm -hmm. Patrick saying teamwork and problem solving is up. Absolutely. So these are great observations. So please um, feel free to keep them coming in the chat. And I see the soft skills and more interpersonal and relationships are way up there from Craig. Absolutely. So no one can predict a future, but we can take a lesson from our past, right? And all of these skills from today, um, the key solution is to integrate them seamlessly within the content. And that's part of digital equity to prepare our students for what these Fortune 5 companies are looking for. And even, you know, thinking outside the box when they want to create their own companies or enterprises or projects or things of that nature or participate in a gig, gig economy and be their own boss, then, you know, they'll need to to know these various things. So what I'm about to do right now is I'm going to play you a quick video. Um, oh, and I see that, yes, Craig is saying, look how low writing and reading are relatively. And Anita saying, wow, reading and computation are way down on the list now. And I want to tell you, um, you all are so right. Uh, these are the, the top 13 skills though. So, you know, out of all of the gamut of skills, so they're still saying that writing and reading are important, um, but they're just, just the priorities are, um, have been kind of changed um, according to this report. And it looks like it kind of flip-flopped up and upside down. So uh, that was, yeah, so that's, that's pretty crazy. And I love, Patsy, what you said. So it's almost like your degrees are not as valuable as how you can get along with people. Anita's saying, remember the three R's in education. Craig is saying, um, interesting how creative thinking is in higher. I've always heard thinking outside the box. And Patrick's saying the disposition of curiosity, collaboration, and thinking throughout the process is in higher demand. Absolutely. So these are all fascinating reflections. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to show you um, a video that perhaps you may have seen, perhaps not. Um, if you if you all have seen it, then um, just bear with me because I, I know that uh, not everyone has. So I'm just going to go ahead and start playing this. Hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Three, two, seven, nine. That is correct. <laughs> Welcome to today's academic challenge. You may only use what's on your table. There will be three rounds and the questions will get harder. What is the largest animal living today? Team A. Blue whale. Team B. Blue whale. That is correct. What is the square root of 144? 12. 12. Correct again. India. India. Neil Armstrong. Neil Armstrong. William Shakespeare. Correct. For round two, we're going to give both teams some additional resources. Okay. Who was the first president to live in the White House? 
John Adams. That is correct. Oh my God. What does the acronym LCD stand for? Wow. Liquid Crystal Display. Correct. Sargasso C. That's correct. Eight minutes and 20 seconds. Correct. Samuel Moore. Correct. Colorado, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and Salt Lake City, Utah. That is correct. Let's pull back the curtain. Please have your team captain open the envelope on the table. 70% of teachers assign homework, requiring access to the internet, and yet 5 million households with school-aged children do not have high-speed internet service at home. That just puts 5 million other people at a disadvantage, which is not okay. Nearly 50% of students say they have been unable to complete a homework assignment because they did not have access to the internet or computer. I didn't know that the percentage was so high. Everything he does is in the computer. So if he didn't have access to it, he wouldn't have a chance. Someone may not be pulling the grade not because they're not smart, they just don't have access to what all the other kids have. Oh, that's so great. All right. All right. Well, thank you all so much for watching that. And I, um, I'm seeing your comments. And when I when I saw this for the first time, it really made an impact on me as well. I wanted to say, hey to Mark, I see that you just joined in. Um, and yeah, it, it really, really made an impact on me the very first time I saw it. So um, yeah, Craig, and I love the captions as well. Like that, that is just a huge um, game changer, speaking of equity, so absolutely. So this is kind of the, the beginning, right? The first part of the presentation, just kind of the why, right? Um, oh, James, the question where you can get that video, it is on, uh, I got it on YouTube. I think that it, it was something about digital equity um, and 1 million, I believe. So um, definitely check that out. I will go back in and drop it in the comments afterwards. Um, and, oh, thank you, Craig. Craig is so quick. Thank you so much, Craig. And I agree, Patsy, the numbers are staggering. So pretty much what we're going to do over the next 40 minutes is that we're going to talk a little bit about three things that um, that make up digital equity. And there are so many different factors that um, that contribute to achieving digital equity. But there's three that we're going to uh, that we're going to target specifically. The first one is about opportunities. So you see the person knocking. Right. The second one is about high quality teaching. And last but not least, we have the elephant in the room that we will address, which is uh, discussing about um, devices and bandwidth. So we'll go ahead and knock that one out first. We'll talk about devices and bandwidth. Yes, I agree, Lisa. Yes, a Google jockey Craig is for sure. And thank you, Craig, for the title. Absolutely, Soul Pancake, if you've never heard of the homework app. All right, so I did some research a few years back. Um, I wanna say, 2018-ish is um, when we started prepping for our book. So one of the very first studies that we cited was this one by Rideout and Katz from 2016. And so they surveyed um, several families, 94% of families surveyed reported having internet access at home, but the type of the access varied. Um, and this is a direct quote. They said, 
one quarter of families below the medium income level and one third of those below the poverty level rely on mobile only internet access. Right. And also many experience interruptions to their Internet service or constrained access to digital services. Other challenges included slow access, sharing devices between multiple members of the household and having service cut because of non-payment. However, and, and once again, I have to I have to emphasize that this was um, conducted in the United States. So that's what these numbers are reflecting. Um, but it's you know, it's the global world worldwide. Um, issue in terms of access to devices. Um, but other than looking at um, what, you know, what what technology was available to families, then they found no significant differences in students' reasons behind home internet use, regardless of their level of access. So we see that most students ages 6 to 13 are doing some of the, many of the same things um, when it comes to internet access. However, the outcomes may be very different. OK, so you can see from this graph that a lot of them do homework. Um, you know, they connect with other students or teachers about classwork, things of that nature. Um, and the slide got a little cut off, but just to tell you, um, the yellow one is that they play games and look things up. Um, and the the one towards the end over here is creativity. OK, so those are um, different things that students do regarding um, their use of internet. All right, so just to frame this, I will give you a little bit of background um, about my story. So I told you that um, that I've been in education for almost 16 years now. I was in the classroom for 10, a little over 10 of those years. So I wanted to share this with you just um, so you see how easy it is just to begin um, in terms of framing your lessons around digital equity. So I went to a conference and I started learning about flipping my classroom. Um, flipping, if you're not familiar with the term, it's like preloading the content. So giving students videos to watch before class. And when they come to class, then they go ahead and they apply their learning. And that gives you more time to work with them directly as opposed to having like a lecture um, in the front of the classroom, right? So uh, I really wanted to do this. So the very first thing I did is that I polled my students and I asked them if they had access to the Internet at home. Now, later I found out that this was not a great question. Like if you go back to the survey that I referenced at the beginning of the section with ride ride out and cats and thank you so much, Craig, for for dropping that link right there. Um, so so the question I should have been asking is how do you connect to the internet at home and having several follow up questions, but this was me at the beginning of my journey. So I asked my students and the numbers came back like this. And so I saw that 45 of my students did have access to the internet um, in some way, shape or form, but the two did not. So I, so I said, okay, um, you know, there, there has to be something to get to these to students to make sure that I am not being part of the problem in terms of assigning things that my students do not have access to. So I decided to use for so I decided to look for solutions. The first place I looked was within the mobile lab um, that was in my classroom. So we had devices for each student and I was able to just use the something called the in class flip, which is basically students were watching the videos inside of class and and that was one option for them um another thing that we tried was to burn the content onto a blank dvd this was really cost effective at the time i bought a spindle of i believe it was a hundred blank dvds for twenty dollars on amazon and i just burned the um i burned the content onto the blank dvd so a third solution I did, and these are my students right here, phone in hand. Um, we had something called a viewing party. And I use the term party very intentionally because I knew that everybody would want to come. So I opened this up to anyone in the classroom who wanted to come. I didn't say this, this is for if you can't watch the videos at home. I said, this is for anyone who would like to watch the videos. And they came up during lunchtime, they would, um, you know, we would all watch the video together. It was a very short video, maybe about five minutes long, and then they would um, 
you know, talk about it. And then the rest of the times just socialize and, and have a good time. So we did this, we did this maybe once a week. Um, so it was, it was a lot of fun. So absolutely. Okay. So these are some solutions that I tried when I was in the classroom. Now for school and district leaders, then COSIN um, is a great organization that talks about, um, it's, it's the, um, consortium for school networking and they have a digital equity toolkit and in their toolkit they came up with nine different strategies that leaders could explore um, to help promote the digital equity so the first five were addressed to districts and the last four targeted school leaders now this i thought it gave good nuggets of information for all stakeholders so regardless of our role um, if we're a classroom teacher if we're a school principal if we are central office you know uh, parent, community member, you know, I, I feel like there were some really good takeaways for for everyone from this toolkit. And thank you so much. Um, I see Anita saying the in class the in class flip and recorded lessons, absolutely. Um, and Craig, thank you for dropping Cyber Man's page. Oh, I love Cyber Man. He has like the internet catalog for educators. It is super cool. Going into the to the Cosin toolkit, then some of their things that they recommended. Um, Fairfax County Public Schools, which is right down the road from me, has a homework hotspot network of community organizations. So on their website, they have an interactive map and a list of community internet access sites in the neighborhood and surrounding areas. And they put this resource out on the internet um, for all of their families to, um, to access. So this is really cool um, because you're able to see here like where there is internet. Right. Um, in addition, there is a great website called Everyone On, and it's a national nonprofit. It creates social and economic opportunities and it connects everyone to the Internet. So it began back in 2012. Um, and since 2012, they've connected more than 600,000 people in 48 states, and they have the goal to connect 1 million people by 2020. Now, I do not know if they have yet reached this goal, but I'd be willing to bet that um, probably now with the current state of affairs that probably there are more and more people um, looking for that support. So absolutely. There's another one called the Sprint One Million Project. We actually use this through my um, through my school district and their mission is to help one million high school students who do not have reliable Internet access at home. Um, they give them mobile devices and free high speed Internet access. So. They, in their first year, they donated 113,000 devices to more than 1,400 high schools in 120 districts across 31 states in the United States. So that, um, for my friends in the United States, and that might be a good thing to check out with your school or district. This is also a U.S.-based resource, um, Kajit, which is school bus Wi-Fi. So Google partnered with Kosin and Kajit to sponsor rolling study halls. And for my international friends, um, perhaps if there are you know, perhaps these resources by name might not be available, but there might be an alternative um, or there might be some uh, something that that these organizations do that might um, might be applicable. So what they what Kajit does is that they have rolling uh, study halls. So mainly for rural districts, what they would do is place Wi-Fi on school buses and students would go home um, and be able to do their assignments on the bus. And it, the, the program focused on three main goals, which were expanding access, expanding support, and expanding in the community, okay? There's also the option of private LTE networks like they did in the school district near me. And I always butcher the pronunciation, but Ablamaro, I believe. So that's in uh, Virginia. And they also had uh, solutions for team leaders, for school leaders, excuse me. So for their assembling a team and developing a shared vision, um, access existing community resources, gaps and needs, engaging stakeholders and partners, as well as developing and executing a project plan. So those were solutions um, that COSIN generated for school leaders, okay? So, on this next slide, I have a quote from one of my really good friends and um, co-authors of the digital um, the digital equity series that we did, uh, the Closing the Gap. So what she said is, I wonder when to shift from seeking resources to assist in teaching and learning, because there is one company 
um, will be the tool resource. My concern is that when we focus on the resource itself, we lose sight of the reason we sought it out in the first place to assist in facilitating learning. So wise words from her not to get too caught up in any specific tool. The tool in itself is not the solution. It's all about um, facilitating those transformational learning opportunities. So with that being said, we are shifting our focus. We just talked about devices and bandwidth, and now we are going to talk about opportunities for transformational learning opportunities. OK, now the why behind this. So the Alliance for Excellence in Education, um, a.k.a. the organization behind Future Ready Schools, they put out something in 2016 that talked about opportunity gaps, um, which are a huge part of digital equity that often go unspoken. Um, and that comes in the form of lower expectations and less access to effective teaching and rigorous coursework. So just providing the access alone um, does not guarantee that all students have an equal opportunity to learn. Um, sometimes when we talk about digital equity, then we see that um, that sometimes a lot of money will be thrown behind getting new products, getting new devices, um, scripted a lot of times, a lot of scripted material that doesn't necessarily allow for students to create. It's drill and kill, um, you know, it's it's drill and kill type stuff that we that we tend to see in a lot of cases um, for students who live in less quote unquote affluent areas. Um, so that's definitely something we need to be mindful of when we're discussing digital equity. So two words to bring to your attention, consume versus produce. So there's this huge debate about screen time. What kind of, how much screen time is enough screen time? How much is too much? Well, my particular take on it is that that's the wrong question to ask is how much screen time is too much. The question should be what are, are students doing with the screen time? Are they consuming it or are they producing? Are they creating different things? There are, there is a huge difference in there. And don't get me wrong, consumption can be good because it can give us like some, um, it can give us inspiration. It can give us background knowledge for when we do produce and do things to make our learning, uh, our learning stick. So just, Think about it and you can, um, oh, thank you so much, uh, Lisa and Craig, not quantity, but quality. Absolutely, absolutely. That is a beautiful way to phrase it. So it's not the quantity of time, but what are they doing with the time? And Craig is saying consuming versus producing. I'm being inspired right now. Thank you so much, Craig. Absolutely. So what are our students doing with their screen time? And also there are some fantastic things that schools and districts are doing. But one question to ask is who has access to the opportunities? Is it just talented and gifted quote unquote students or is it everyone? Is it just affluent students or is it everyone, right? Those are questions that we need to ask in addition to who has access to the higher course tracks. And I see that Lisa dropped a study in the chat. Thank you so much for that, McDonald 2016. I love that. I'm gonna need to go in and check that out. So. I referenced um, one of my good friends, Dr. Avril Smart um, from the Alliance for Excellent Education. She shared this great resource from Oakland Unified School District, and they created an office of equity. Um, and I know Oakland that is in your state, Craig and Lisa, yes. <laughs> so the office of equity was established to eliminate the correlation between social and cultural factors and the probability of success. So pretty much what that means is that they were looking to interrupt and eliminate inequitable practices. So systematically, you know, when schools or districts were kind of limiting access to different students, um, access to the to to higher track classes, um, this office was put into place to combat that. Okay, so they had a database that they created with various demographics and making sure that there's representation um, in the higher track classes. So that was something really cool. So Craig is saying, woo woo, Oaktown, my birthplace. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I have a cousin in Oakland as well. Like uh, like my my um, my Oakland family. Yes, love them so much. So I'm going to um, tell you about one school doing it well. I'm going to give you an example. I actually used to teach at this school for a very short period of time, um, but this is from Oxon Hill High School over in Maryland, and 
every year there's like a student um there's a student video festival, student film festival. So this is the winning entry, I want to say from 2008. And ironically, it's about screen time. <laughs> I thought that that was kind of cool. Um, but I'll just play for you just a little bit of um, this video here. So I'll stop it there, but oh my goodness, watching that gives me goosebumps because these are high school kids doing this. I have a degree in radio, TV, film, and I don't think any of my undergrad films were anywhere near that good. So just when we allow students to create, just what they come up with is just mind blowing, okay? So how does this look in 2020? Um, one way that we can help students to create and to provide transformational learning experiences for them is to help them build networks. Um, there was a really great study by the um, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and they looked at the phrase social capital, and they, um, they defined it as networks together with shared norms, values, and understandings that facilitate cooperation within or among groups. And they break it down even more into three categories. They talk about social, um, they talked about social capital with bonds, which are links to quote unquote people like us, right? Such as family, close friends, and people who share our culture or ethnicity. They also talked about bridges um, as a social capital, links that stretch beyond a shared sense of identity, and also linkages, which are links to people or groups further up or down the social ladder. So Julia Freeland Fisher um, is the director of education research at the Clayton Christensen Institute. And she has tons of work out there saying that schools are in a perfect position to assist students in creating exclusive network through bridges. And just to kind of remind you, bridges are links that, sh that stretch beyond a shared sense of identity. OK, so she did some some great work, put out this article in 2018 about ways that we as educators can help students bridge these connections. And she was talking about focusing on a network of care. So that kind of touches on the social emotional learning piece of it, right? Uh, setting the school system in terms of slots in which a student can learn. And I, I have to admit, the very first time I saw this, I was just like, this is kind of a heavy lift because things have been a certain way for some time. And, you know, sometimes it's, um, Sometimes it's really hard to change. However, now in this kind of volatile situation that we're in with remote learning, then this might be the perfect opportunity to do that. Also, incorporating project-based learning. Uh, many educators have been doing this for a while. Um, expanding students' access through advisory and also exploring opportunities for change in school design, right? And once again, that is, we are in a perfect position now with remote learning and everything kind of being up in the air as to how are we going to move forward and continue to do this thing called education, right? So I feel like right now this is the perfect time for us to um, to maybe implement some some new strategies and some new uh, some new things that we could do with our students. Okay, all right. So another thing is to connect students with one another. So back in uh, 2018, uh, on Valentine's Day, then very tragically, um, there was a school shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Okay, so many of us might be familiar with that. Um, in response to this tragedy, then we saw something, something beautiful was born out of this tragedy, this senseless tragedy, where we saw the students leverage the power of social media 
and they launched the Never Again movement. And their point behind doing this was to fight for change to prevent incidents from ever having again, ever happening again. Okay, so this, what the students did organically on their own. This reminds us that we're not only preparing students for academic or career achievement, but also for life in a complicated, messy, often brutal world. That is a quote from uh, Sarah Stokel um, in 2018. I, I, I love that, okay? Um, also, another colleague of mine over at Loyola, Marie Heath, um, Dr. Heath promoted looking beyond traditional definitions of digital citizenship. Um, and, you know, if, if you've been, kind of following the digital citizenship movement, then you've seen it transform. So in the traditional sense, at the beginning, then we were talking about safety, but now it's kind of evolved to some of the things that she listed, um, which were engaged citizenship, um, ways for students themselves to address issues of equity, and strong pedagogy of liberation. So those Oh my goodness, speaking my language, I love it 100%. So I'm gonna show you a couple examples of some students and I'm seeing that Lisa is dropping some knowledge on us. Thank you so much, Lisa, about um, another project by young people about things that really matter. And I cannot wait to check this out. Thank you so, so, so much. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a few examples of, of some kids I know who have really leveraged um, all of the resources available to them to create something phenomenal. So. This is uh, Joshua, okay? So Joshua is a young man from Florida and I'll play a little bit about what he does for you. When you think of Miami, you think of you know rich, glamour, but five miles away from the beach, there's people who've never seen the beach. I was confused why somebody was in this situation, especially in America. started Joshua's Heart Foundation, it was a key thing to be able to engage youth in the foundation to help them participate. I think passing on the torch and lighting a new flame in another person to do good is probably the point of the bigger missions that I have. So we are each making a bigger difference. Just giving back and producing love for everybody. So Joshua is an amazing young man. Um, I've had the pleasure of connecting with him virtually a couple times. Never met him um, face to face, but I'm super inspired by his story. And at the age of five, I believe it was, he had this idea and his parents and his family just supported him and, uh, and ran with it. So I love that. Okay. There's also this young lady, Olivia, who is on Twitter at the Live Bits. Um, and she is a reader, thinker, and kid voice believer. She's also a social media leader, believe it or not. She's probably like 13 years old right now, I want to say. And she hosts her own podcast. And I have to tell you, she is a dynamic speaker. There was um one conference where I was the opening keynote and she was the closer. And oh my gosh, I was watching her because I was about to get on the plane and um, watching her on Periscope. It was just so amazing, so amazing. We also have this young man, Brayden, and he is a nephew of one of my good friends, Rafrans Davis, and his artwork is phenomenal. Like this kid is unreal. Looking at this picture, um, I'm thinking this is probably about maybe four, three or four years ago, and you can already see like, just mad skills. I, I wish. <laughs> I wish I had any fraction of the skills that he has. But um and and now the most recent pieces of art that I've seen him produce, just breathtaking. So um this young man is really working his talent and working social media to share his gift with the world. There's also Curran D. He's a little older than that right now, but you see him and his mom. Um Curran is the founder of Dig Sit Kids, which is an organization for kids by kids, a global organization with students working together um, for digital citizenship. So just an amazing um, mother and son team right there. Also shout out to the dad, Sean. He is also phenomenal. So great family. Another great family 
um, Ayush um, and his sister and his mom, the Chopra family, they are phenomenal. Ayush is um, a leader of SG SDGs for kids by kids. So uh, just sharing the sustainable development goals from the United Nations. So he's been an advocate for that for a very long time. Uh, we also have our my hometown girl, <laughs> Naomi Wadler. So this is back in 2018. So this is two years old, um, but I know she's still going out and rocking it and doing her thing. I'll play for you like maybe the first 30 seconds or so, uh, just because I am being very cognizant of the time. <laughs> so let me go ahead and play this, the first 30 My seconds. Me and my friend Carter led a walk out at our elementary school on the 14th. We walked out. We walked out for 18 minutes, adding a minute to honor Cortland Arrington, an African American girl who was the victim of gun violence in her school in Alabama after the Parkland shooting. I am here today to represent Cortland Arrington. I am here today to represent Hadia Pendleton. I. <laughs> I am here today to represent Tiana Thompson, who at just 16 was shot dead in her home here in Washington, DC. I am here today to acknowledge and represent the African-American girls whose stories don't make the front page of every national newspaper. Wow, that, oh my gosh. Every time I watch that, I get emotional, <laughs> but oh my gosh, so powerful. At 11 years old, our students, our kids, they have this in them and you know, it's it's our job to help nurture them. Um, so just a resource I wanted to throw out there, rockyourworld.org. This is a great site for PBL, so you could definitely check that out. Um, Jackie, I see your comment about she was one of my favorite speakers during March for Our Lives. Absolutely same here. Yes, just an amazing, amazing uh, student. OK. All right. So where does this take us? Takes a, so our goal is to get to innovation, right? Uh, to, to, for all of us collectively to get to innovation. We also have to keep in mind this thing called privacy. So they're not two separate things, but what we wanna do is to make sure that we get into that sweet spot where innovation meets privacy. We have to merge together to find our sweet spot. Okay, so just a, a last, um, that was the last caveat of this section. All right, so another great quote from a friend of mine, Chris Avilas, um, just to give you the end part of this, by sharing the great things students have done, you create the opportunity for someone to want to invest in your class. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> so talking about um, opportunities. So the opportunities are everywhere. So now we are going to switch gears and we're gonna talk a little we're gonna we're gonna look in the mirror a little bit okay and i'm gonna try to go a little faster because i know that we only have about 13 minutes and i want to leave some time at the end for q a if we have it but okay this video scared the mess out of me and it it, it might possibly be one of the scariest videos i have ever seen watch this here we go this is this is actually old too so so take a look at this i won't play the whole thing but just just a bit of it now with former President Obama taking on fake news, except turns out it is not really President Obama in this PSA. This is a clear example of technology that could become more widely used. And ABC's David Wright is here with more. David, this video is proof that we can't believe everything that we see online. That is right, Paula. Good morning. Uh, they say that the camera never lies, but technology is advancing so fast that it can lie with greater and greater effectiveness. And that's the point of this new video from Jordan Peele. Our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. Former President Barack Obama, right? So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, I don't know, Killmonger was right. Wrong. You see, I would never say these things, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. Whoa! <laughs> So I just paused that video, um, but that brings around the concept of something called deep fakes. So if you can't trust video, then what can you trust, right? Because for the longest time, it was just like, okay, you know, I won't believe it unless I see it um, in print. Okay, well now, you know, people can manipulate print. I won't believe it until I hear an audio clip. People can manipulate audio. Then it was, I won't believe it until I see a video clip. 
Oh my goodness. Now what can you trust, right? So that underscores the need for us to become more um, media literate as educators so we can help our students to navigate these spaces. And I want to show you, oh, and Lisa said that deep fakes are supposed to be a big factor in US politics in the next election. Absolutely. So we need to know about these things, right? Uh, we need to know about these things so that we can better um, prepare our students for such things. So, um, and the video I showed you, it was a pretty convincing Obama. I mean, you can still tell that, you know, maybe something was off about it, but um, that video was two years ago. And you know how quickly things move with technology. So I, I don't even want to see a 2020 deep fake because I think that that would really fake me out possibly. So just the need for media literacy, okay? So um, here, just wanted to share with you another message uh, from the U.S. Department of Education back in 2016. So once again, access to, con to connectivity and devices does not guarantee that we're doing enough for digital equity. A digital use divide, they brought around the term digital use divide, could grow even as access to technology in schools increases. So this kind of goes back to what we were saying at the beginning about drill and kill versus opportunities to create, right? So my coworker, Kim, found this really cool matrix um, by Dr. Royce Kim and called PICRAT. Um, and you'll see on the left-hand side, this PIC is the student's relationship to technology. The RAT at the bottom is a teacher's uses, uh, the teacher's use of um, technology. So what it does is it explores technology use and integration through the behaviors of both teachers and students. So that's one of the reasons why it's my personal favorite. So the goal is that we want everyone to be able to deliver lessons on a CT. Not all lessons are going to be CT. You know, there are some lessons that um, that might, you know, fall in, in these spaces or even down here. And, and once in a while, that is okay. But we want to make sure that, that everyone can deliver these CT and can touch upon it um, at some point. Yeah, pick rat. I know this is this is crazy. This blew my mind when I saw it. So so how do we do this? One great step is uh, teacher preparation programs. OK, so culturally relevant and sustaining pedagogy is a key component. And, you know, that way, um, let me just kind of go back and uh, go off script for a second. Um, oh, let me see. So I see that Lisa's saying so goals for students to create discrepant events. Uh, let me go back for a second. So the pick rat, the goal is for students to be uh, creative, to be able to create, but the, the teacher would provide a transformational experience where, where it actually creates like a change. So I would highly recommend that y'all check out this, this whole pick rat thing. Like there's, there's a lot more explanation behind it. Just look up pick rat and Dr. Royce Kimmins and Dr. Kimmins goes really, really into it. Okay, and thank you so much, Jackie. I see that you dropped the link in chat. So fantastic. All right. So one of the missing steps is the teacher preparation programs. So two main things um, should be occurring here. The on ongoing integrated technology. I know that um, I came through alternative certification, uh, but a lot of people who came through traditional programs, uh, I'm hearing more and more that technology integration is a piece of it, right? Um, I know that people who came through around the same time I did, you know, technology has shifted so much. So it's not even the same ballpark <laughs> right now, but definitely technology integration needs to be a huge part of it. And the culturally relevant pedagogy needs to be embedded throughout as well. Um, so um, pretty much what it means is that teachers should be representative of all cultures. Um, in their in their teaching practice that's just the culturally relevant pedagogy culturally sustaining pedagogy takes it a step further where the teacher takes a more active role um in in navigating the student's um cultural identity right um but all of that needs to be uh needs to be put into the teacher preparation programs okay uh let's see here so um, oh, and one more note about that. This should not be viewed as a box to be checked, but it should be purposeful and interwoven throughout the course of the program. So another key piece is about um, is about professional learning opportunities. So, you know, conferences, uh, virtual opportunities such as the one that we're doing right now, 
all of this is, um, you know, definitely helps us to provide these transformational learning opportunities for our students. So just a quick, a few quick facts and figures to, to kind of throw. Um, sometimes when you get to, when you get to the PD, then the teacher access is expensive and there's a wide variation in support given as well as in teacher salaries to pay for this. So just that's pretty much what these next few slides are saying right here, that it there's an inequity in itself in terms of how much support is being given to us as educators to pursue these opportunities. However, there are several free ones available. You all are participating in one as right now. Um, let me see, Craig, you're saying that your slides are frozen. Um, hopefully you can see this one right now. I have up the average public school teacher salary. So you see state to state is different. Country to country is different. Um, so that's kind of where we are. So, so it's not enough for schools and districts to say, hey, you know, figure it out on your own. You know, there needs to be definitely some support provided. Uh, that being said, there are also several free opportunities available. So right now uh, we are doing um, we are doing the Global EdTech Academy uh, that is available for free. Also putting a quick plug in for EduMatch, which is a PLN, um, Professional Learning Network. Um, that's the one that, that I have created, but there's several professional learning networks available right now. And one thing that I'm seeing during the remote teaching process, it's giving me a lot of hope, is that more and more people are getting connected. I'm seeing Facebook groups being started and, you know, within maybe a week or two, then they have like dozens of thousands of members in them. And I'm just like, whoa, this is amazing because this is what I've been hoping to see for like ever, right? Ever since I got, um, ever since I became a part of, uh, ever since I became connected, I should say. So that was back in about 2013 and just advocating for people to join these professional learning networks. And now we're, we're actually seeing it uh, being adopted at a more, um, more, at a larger scale, okay? So there's other opportunities. There's EdCamp Voice, there's different podcasts that are put out by educators. Um, yep, and I agree, Craig, there are so many Facebook groups, absolutely. There's also Pass the Scope EDU. I think that they're coming up with a new event um, on uh, Thursday of this week, if I'm not mistaken, um, and they use the Periscope app to, to learn and grow together, so there's also Twitter, so I see that in here there's a lot of uh, tweeters. Um, so, you know, definitely I put my info back up if you want to connect, but just a little graphic I threw together um, about kind of a continuum for Twitter, give or take. Um, you know, there's creating an account and then taking a step further and lurking. Um, Craig had dropped one of Cyber Man's research resources, right? Um, he has a, a great list of Twitter chats as well as hashtags. Um, then you can participate, you can go in, do different things such as Twitter chats where you get together, talk about uh, um, surrounding a hashtag at a given time and, you know, someone asks questions, you answer them, everyone learns together is a beautiful thing. And the last thing is to lead. So, you know, at this point, you um, once you have your feet wet, then you can start organizing Twitter chats and things of that nature. So. Yeah, I see, Jackie, how can they when everything now is virtual? Absolutely, I hear you. We are in a different world. It's a different world than, when you, than where you're coming from, <laughs> right? That's the theme song of one of my favorite shows. Okay, so we talked about some ways that uh, we become high-quality educators. We cannot do it in isolation, though, right? We are not silos. So um, it takes us all to work together to support digital equity. Another resource I'll throw out there is Future Ready. They are fantastic if you're um, US based and even if you're not, they have uh, Facebook groups and things of that nature, as well as uh, different resources available for people uh, to just kind of come together and, and, and learn. Um, so I'll leave you with some wise words from my friend, Dr. Josue Falez. So we all have to work together. So for every district leader, you can begin to identify ed tech uh, disparities or inequities and work towards remedying them. For every school leader, you can begin to model the integration of technology. And for every classroom teacher, begin connecting your students to sources outside the classroom. So love those wise words to end with. And uh, also check out the ISTE Digital Equity PLN uh, for more information and a couple of slides here about, um, about the book series, Closing the Gap. 
And once again, that is my info. If you are on Twitter, then please uh, connect with me. I would love to connect with you and learn more together. So that is about it. So I'm going to go ahead right now, stop sharing my screen and pop back in. And uh, if there are any questions or anything like that, then please feel free or anything that you want to share, then please feel free to do so. I love, I, I want to thank you all so much for your time and for your attention and for sharing everything that you did in the chat that really made, um, that really made this like a two way type thing. And I, I loved it. I loved it. Okay. Thank you thank all you, so Anna. much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate y'all being here. Thank you. All right. And I, I think I'm going to be doing this again on Monday, if I'm not mistaken. So if you uh, have any friends who want to catch it live, then uh, please, uh, please let me know. All right. Thank you all so much and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon.